How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Mr. Donnie here again. This time we're going to take a look at ideal versus real gases. So our objectives will be to describe how real gases deviate from ideal gases and under what conditions is a gas going to behave the most ideal. We're also going to try to explain the significance of the van der Waals equation. All right, so ideal gases versus real gases. What's the difference? Well, in ideal gases, we say the volume of the gas molecules are negligible. We assume that it's zero. So the actual volume that they can occupy is the entire volume of the container, right? We go, hey, these particles are so tiny, they're not even there, we can ignore the volume of them. But real gases, molecules have a non-zero volume. So the actual volume that they can occupy is gonna be the volume of the container minus the volume of all the molecules. So when do these particles behave most ideally? Under low pressure. The lower the pressure, it means we have less molecules per that same volume which means there's less significant of an impact that the volume of the molecules has, right? So under high pressure, it's like we packed all these in, there's not a whole lot of free volume in that container left, but under low pressure, they got all this room to spread out and the actual volume of the gas particles is low compared to the volume of the container. All right, continuing. Ideal gases, there's no attraction between gas molecules. So if this gas molecule is flying off this way, there is literally no attraction to any of those other gas particles. But in real gases, there is an attraction between gas molecules. It's usually really low, but it's not zero. So if these gas particles are attracting that moving gas particle, it's slowing down this gas particle, which means when it collides with the wall, the pressure is going to be less than if there was no attraction. So the pressure exerted by gas is decreased. All right, what about, uh, you know, attractive forces? When do they behave the most ideal? The smaller the molecule, the weaker the attractive force is. So if we take a look at xenon, a noble gas with a mass of 131, its boiling point is negative 110 degrees Celsius. But if we take a look at helium, which has a mass of four, you can see that its boiling point is significantly lower. So the attraction is a lot less in the smaller molecules. So when do gases behave the most ideal? When they're really tiny. And then also temperature affects attractive forces, right? So under high temperature, there's more energy in those particles, which means they're more likely to bounce off another molecule instead of sticking together. So if we're talking about these things being attracted to each other, if they're going really slow, that attraction can take over and kind of hold them together. But if they're going really fast, that attraction will not hold them together. So low temperature, when they bump together, they might end up just hanging out because there's attraction there. Whereas high temperature, they're much more likely to kind of just bounce off each other. All right, they also behave most ideally when they're under low pressure uh, because of attractive forces. If there's less molecules per volume, there's more distance between the molecules, which means the attractive forces are weaker. The attraction between these gas particles that are touching each other, super strong compared to, well, what is that attraction over all of this distance, right? So high pressure, uh, less ideal, low pressure, more ideal. So... Ideal gases, we got PV equals NRT. That's our ideal gas law, right? But real gases, uh, it's not PV equals NRT because we gotta account for the attraction and the volume of these particles, right? The available volume is less because the molecules actually take up volume. And then the pressure exerted by the gas molecules is less because of the intermolecular attractions. Uh, they're being slowed down because they're attracted to the other gas particles. Enter the van der Waals equation. Right, so this is this crazy looking ugly thing. Let's, let's work through it so it makes sense. P is pressure, that's nothing new. V, volume, nothing new there. N is the moles of gas, so that should be pretty familiar. R is a gas constant. T is temperature, so those are all things that hopefully we've seen before. All right, but this little A right here is a measure of how strongly the gas molecules are attracted to one another. So, you know, is it a really strong attraction or is it a relatively weak attraction? Uh, the more attractive they are, the greater the A value, right? So, yeah. The more moles of gas that there are, the more attraction there is going to be, right? That's why you have this N squared times A. If you have more gases in there crammed together, the attraction between them is going to be more significant. Uh, the more volume you have 
for those particles to spread out, right? So this is all divided by V2. If you increase the V, the volume, they have more room to spread out, which means the attraction is lessened, right? The effect of how attracted they are is less if they have a bunch of room to spread out. Now B is accounting for the fact that those gas particles take up volume, right? So the more moles of gas there are, the greater the volume of space that those gas particles will occupy, which is why we have N times B. The more moles of gas you have, the more significant of an impact it's gonna have on that volume. And then also, the bigger the molecule, the bigger the B value for it, right? So some molecules might be significantly larger than other ones. So this little section of the van der Waals equation is accounting for uh, the pressure difference of real gases compared to ideal gases, right? The pressure plus this value, we're accounting for the difference in pressure of real gases. The NB over here, we're correcting for the volume that real gases occupy. Uh, you might be able to see how these corrections work more uh, easily if you rearrange the equation. Let's say, for example, let's see, uh, let's solve for P. All right, so we have this equation. If I wanna get P by itself, I have to divide each side by volume minus NB. Oh, that's... And now we fix this, but we want pressure by itself. So now we're gonna to have to subtract N squared A over V squared. So minus N squared A over V squared. And what I end up with is pressure equals NRT over V minus NB minus N squared A on V squared. All right, so let's see what happens to the pressure when we account for these real factors. All right, so now that we have it rearranged to solve for pressure, let's see how this, um, the different corrections affect the overall pressure. So we know B is accounting for the fact that real gases take up space and there is less real volume in the container. So let's say that we had a really big value for B, super big. Well, volume minus a really big number is gonna end up with a really tiny number, which means my pressure will have gone up. So the bigger the, the volume of the gas, the greater the pressure is actually going to be because the available volume is lower. Um, yeah. And then A, let's see what happens when we mess with our values for A. A is accounting for the attractive forces between the gas particles. Let's say we had a really big value for A. Well, we're doing pressure, some number minus, well, A is in the numerator, so if it's really, really big, we're gonna end up with a bigger value. And when we are subtracting it, then the pressure is going to decrease, which makes sense with what we were saying. As the attraction increases, the pressure those particles are gonna exert is less, right? Um, yeah, greater the attraction, lower the pressure. All right, so using the equation, there's nothing really special about using it. It's gonna be like, here's all the variables except for one, solve for that one. Um, so rearrange for the thing you're trying to get and then plug and chug and there you go. So an example, if a five mole sample of an ideal gas were confined to 22.41 liters at zero Celsius, it would exert a pressure of five atmospheres. So that's what a perfect gas would do. Use the van der Waals equation to estimate the pressure exerted by five moles of chlorine gas under these conditions. And then they tell us what the values for A and for B are. So we're trying to get pressure by itself. So let's see, we got to divide each side by V minus NB to get rid of this one and then subtract the N squared A over V2. I end up with pressure is gonna equal NRT divided by V minus NB minus N squared A on V squared. So now we just plug and chug. How many moles of gas do we got? Well, it says five. So five times R, which I'm using atmospheres and stuff, so 0 0.08206. Um, I should write my units, five moles. This is uh, liter atmospheres over mole Kelvin. That's my R times my T at zero Celsius is 273 Kelvin divided by V. Well, my volume is, they said, what's it? 22.41 liters minus N 
I got five moles times my B value, which they tell me is right here, 0 0.05262 liters per mole. And then minus, I might have to write it down here, minus N squared A. So five squared times my A value, which is at 6.49 divided by my volume squared, so 22.4 liters squared. And when I do all that, when I finally plug and chug, I get 4.73 atmospheres. So you can see the pressure of this real gas is actually gonna be less than the ideal gas, all right? So summarize, can you describe how real gases deviate from ideal gases and under what conditions a gas is going to behave the most ideal? Uh, can you explain the significance of the van der Waals equation? Uh, you probably won't do too much math with the van der Waals equation. You should be able to do it, but you should most importantly be able to explain the significance of A and B and what they're correcting for in real gases. All right, I hope you found that helpful. See you in class. Goodbye.